It's now time for communication studies. I am Charmaine Tingling, and assisting me this morning is Diane Hines, who will walk you through the objective. So today we're going to be discussing research and the sourcing of information. And the main objective that we are going to be paying key focus to today is that we're going to evaluate the effect of primary and secondary sources, context, and medium. We're also going to look at how those concepts that I just mentioned earlier impact reliability and validity of the information that you collect. So let us get started. Now we're looking at what is research? Now when you think of the word research, you're thinking of two particular, a word broken into two parts. We have the prefix, re, which means again, as in rewrite, repeat. We also have the root word, which is a, an old French word, searcher, which means to search or to look for. So in simple terms, what does the word research mean? Simply put, it means to search for something with a view of finding it. So you're looking for something, you're seeking to find something, you're seeking to find information about something. Further, it means to study materials and sources to establish facts and to reach conclusions. Research can also be defined as you systematically seeking to provide answers to questions that you may have. Simply put, research can further be seen as repetitive actions. So it's a series of activities that you consistently do. All right, so don't get all boggled, don't worry. It is just simply a series of activities that you will undertake. Now, let us find out a little bit more about this idea of research and what it entails. Mistake All name. right. Now, on the screen, you see what is data. And data is a critical component of research. It is crucial. It is very, very important. Without data, there is no research, right? Um, as it says, one critical component of research is the collection and analysis of data. So what is this data? It is simply a collection of facts, numbers, observations, which really is information pulled from a variety of sources. If you see on the screen, there we have a compilation of books and also um, graphs and charts with a uh, calculator, cal calculator <laughs> to assist. Thank you so much. I'm not a math person. All right. So moving on. What is the purpose of data then? Hmm, I see that look. You're having it right there in your living room as well. It is to evaluate, really to assess outcomes and to understand a problem or a topic, to make sense of it. You read the information and you can sift through and get a better grasp of what this is saying. All right? That is the purpose of gathering information. Now, data gathering. So we are moving step by step. We understand the purpose. Now we are looking at gathering, accumulating, acquiring this information. We may use the terms for communication studies, data, and, or some of you might say data. Or we might use the terms interchangeably. Now, in order for this exercise not to overwhelm you, like it is doing Jungle. Bright Barry over there. You <laughs> see Bright Barry breaking his back with information <laughs> overload. Um, you ask yourself these questions. What is your purpose? You're going to ask that for collecting data. No, you're on six formers now. You, congratulations, by the way. You have just gone through, some of you, your CSEC English. You got your grades one, two, and three. And uh, you are now ready to go. Some of you were in sixth form last year, did Caribbean studies. This year you're doing communication studies. And that's awesome. It is... So you are going to be doing your IA. That's your internal assessment. That's your purpose for collecting this information. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, what kind of data, ask yourself that, do you need and where can this be sourced? For... Mm -hmm. 
For example, this person having difficulty in um, the challenge in accumulating data too much. All right. So now you would get your topic because you're going to do your IA. What is your topic? We selected one for you. Social media and its impact on the behavior of teenagers. So that's your topic. Immediately, you begin to think of the kind of information that you're going to need, True. right, with regards to this topic. What makes sense, mm -hmm. all right? You also ask yourself, can this data be sourced by using, can it be sourced externally using existing databases, or will I have to collect this data myself? using quantitative and qualitative instruments. Now, don't you worry about these terms that you may not have heard before. We are going to walk you through them. The last thing you're gonna ask yourself, does my research topic require that I use both, both qualitative and quantitative? Have no fear, Ms. Sainz is going to take you through what the meanings. Now, as Ms. Tingling told you, don't worry, we're here to assist. And so when you think of data and collecting data and the fact that in conducting a research, you may need to collect your own data. You may choose to use what we classify as qualitative instruments. And these refer to simple instruments such as interviews, observation, focus groups. And all of these instruments allow you to collect what we like to classify as subjective data. Simply put, that's personal opinions, experiences, thoughts, and all of this information, you will note, has nothing to do with statistics and numbers. So any data that is qualitative in nature is subjective in nature and has nothing to do with numbers. Quantitative instruments, on the other hand, allow you to collect this kind of statistical information because it is steeped in statistics, it's steep. It's steeped in numerical data, all right? So it means that you, your ideas rather are expressed through graphs and tables and charts. And even further, it allows you to focus more on a larger population for your research. Now, I also mentioned along with Ms. Tingling, that when you are collecting data, you may choose to use existing databases. Now, these are what we will like to call your sources. And this, this set of sources, this database that you will go to, will consist of two main kinds of sources. They are primary sources and secondary sources. So let's explore the difference between the two, if there is a difference between the two. Primary sources. Now, like the name suggests, it comes first. Primary sources provide direct evidence, first-hand accounts of events that were recorded or created during the period under investigation. So, for example, I mentioned earlier observations, interviews, photographs. So we're thinking about, let us say you're looking at the Holocaust and the impact that it had on the Jews. You could very well interview, if you can find, someone who has experienced, a Jew who has experienced or has, who went through the Holocaust, forgive me. You can also use primary sources. Sorry, primary sources also provide you with narrative data. So it's often narrative in style rather than analytical and evaluative. Now, when you hear that term, analytical, evaluative, you're thinking about assessment and interpretations. Primary sources do not necessarily offer you this. What they offer instead, for example, autobiographies and stories and recordings, they offer you a narrating of the events as opposed to an assessment of the event. Now, primary sources can also be subjective in nature 
that is, because they are reflecting the thoughts, the ideas, the experiences of the author or the creator of the content, it will reflect in some way the viewpoint that the author or the creator may have. Even further, you will find some biases that are included in the process, included in the content. For example, again, diary entries of witnesses. Now let us look now at some benefits of using primary sources. Primary sources can aid in developing critical thinking. Now you may be wondering, now how will this do that for me? And I will explain. Now, if you have to rifle through several primary sources that are presenting information on the same problem or the same topic, then you are forced now to think about really what is crucial to the topic that I am doing. What is pertinent to the problem that I am assessing? And in so doing, your critical thinking skills will be molded because now you are forced to go through and identify that which is pertinent to what you aim to achieve, which is your purpose. Primary sources enable the researcher to access authentic information related to the topic or problem under investigation. Think about it. Now, if you want to research a particular area and you want to get information that is real, that is directed towards the problem, that is directed towards the topic, then primary resources, primary sources will be the ones that will provide you with that kind of authentic information that you will need. They can allow the researcher to construct knowledge about the context within which the problem or phenomenon exists. Now let me stop there and bring to the fore the idea of context. Now remember when we talk about context, context refers to the situational environment. You're thinking of the social environment. So it allows the researcher to construct knowledge, build knowledge, gain information about the situational environment that the author or creator of the data lives in. It further allows you to build a sort of understanding of history, a kind of continuum, a kind of understanding of the evolution of activities and events and recordings. And in so doing, again, you are learning more, thereby building on the knowledge that you have of the particular problem or phenomenon. And in this case, you can think of phenomenon as an occurrence. Now in all things, there are some drawbacks to primary sources. And one of those speaks to verification. Now let us think about you doing a topic which is steeped in history. It is going to be very difficult for you to find someone who has lived through the Holocaust now. So it is hard for you, let us say if you're using a diary entry or you are using a recording of a witness's report, it is hard for you to find that individual to verify whatever data was recorded or to find the author or creator of the data, to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, to try to authenticate the information. Now, the accounts, perceptions, thoughts, and reactions to topics may change if there are changes in the environment. What do I mean by that? Now, think about it. The way how you see something now, is it the way you saw that same thing or problem, situation. its situation, 
Is it the same way you viewed it last week or a month ago? Probably not. So I am saying this to say that oftentimes how we view things or perceptions about things can change because the variables in our context may change or, and this may be externally or internally, because remember communication itself can also take place internally. So the things that are happening within the context can change and thereby impact how we see things, how we view things, how we react to things, really. So now, that I've explained primary sources, I will hand the baton over to Ms. Tingling, who will take you through secondary sources. Thank you so much. You're saying that the biases that may be contained in the primary source will affect what? It will affect how reliable that information can right. be. Thank you, ma'am. It can also affect how accurate the information All is. All right. Now, the secondary sources. Now, Ms. Sainz spoke to primary sources being first and information. So if I'm going to be looking at secondary sources, then I'm thinking that secondary by its very nature comes after. All True. right, uh, yes. Uh, let us just say Miss Hines calls, she calls me mommy. And she then would be the daughter. So I am the primary source here and Miss Hines would be secondary. <laughs> just connecting, making application. Now, what it does is to offer information produced after an event occurs. A prime example of that would be your history textbooks. You're looking at further afield, we could look at the Cold War, coming closer to home, slavery, colonialism, all of that. Mm -hmm. Information would be stored and recorded, recorded in your history textbooks. It offers also analysis, interpretations, and evaluations of primary and other secondary sources, such as your journal, and uh, your scholarly writings, all right? What it does again is to offer neutrality in their presentation of information. For example, your, and interpretations, the documentaries, National Geographic, that's something that we really enjoy. I love to see young people really enjoying watching those doc documentaries. They're totally unbiased, based on facts. A giraffe is a giraffe with a long neck, all right? <laughs> that's what it is. So, all right, of course, there are benefits of the secondary sources. Now, the data is easier to access when compared to the primary data, as we would have seen uh, talking about interviews and going off into diaries and all of that. The, inter the secondary source um, information is really at your fingertips, especially mm -hmm. the technological With world the in which we live, the internet. Mm -hmm. And we will get into that afterwards. So I know most of you students, you sit there, you're smiling because you say, wow, well, my IA is going to reach, um, be based primarily on secondary sources. Secondary sources also provide a window for the researcher to generate new insights into existing data. So it allows you the scope to think. Ah, so yes, it allows for critical thinking. It does allow for critical thinking, all right? So you see, STEM will never, ever be outdated. It carries never, you ever. through life. There That's, you go. All right. Now, again, we have the drawback. Uh, now, secondary data may not provide information specific to what you're looking for. It also happens that you might have to search through, wade through irrelevant data before you finally get to what you want. True. Right? Some of the data is exaggerated due to personal biases. You know, for example, the editorials and commentaries. It's it, what I think I am going to speak and I'm going to write. So we have to look at that exaggerated information. So please read objectively. Mm -hmm. Secondary data, also, the sources may also be outdated. And unfortunately, there may be no new data to replace the old ones. Those are the drawbacks that you will find in the secondary sources. Now, you're going to ask yourself the, que uh, the question. After all of that, we're looking at sources. We told you about the primary and the secondary. You looked at qualitative and quantitative, but where do I go to find all of this? Remember, 
at the end of the lesson, you should look nothing like Bright Barry, but with his back breaking um, over information overload, we want you to be relaxed and to approach your research with a focused and intelligent way, right? Not like Bright Barry, who, by the way, is the brother of Miss Science. <laughs> Well, because my brother, Bright Barry, is suffering, I am going to help him through. So you are thinking now, where do I go to source all of this information? And you feel like a hamster on a wheel. Don't worry, we've got you. So think about it. You have something at your fingertips that you use every day, and it's called the internet. Boop! One click. And it it opens up a world of information for you. Now think about it. As a resource tool, the internet offers both primary and secondary data. I bet you didn't know that. Didn't know that, did you? Think about it. The blogs and the vlogs that you view every day, that's primary source. Those are primary sources right there. Because in those sources, what do you find happening? People are narrating what they're going through, narrating their experiences, narrating their opinions. You can also access through the internet scholarly journals, online magazines, and ebooks. Yes, right there on the internet. You can also use the internet for quick referencing. How many times have you been in class? And be honest. How many times have you been in class and Miss asks a question? And the first thing you do is to whip out your phones and go, Google, what's the meaning of? In no time, you have the meaning and you can reference. So think about the internet as that space. So Miss Science, the internet then caters to different types of learners because you actually speak to Google. You can or speak you type to Google. It, okay, or Google. you type OK, and Google. You the information is right there. Boop. So the internet offers billions of pages of information just right there, one click. But it can get cumbersome when you find that all of this information is just coming at you quickly. Now, what I want you to do is to stop, slow down, think about your topic, and then brainstorm. Now, what I am going to provide for you today is what I like to call the basic information sourcing process. Now, remember I just said to you, stop, slow down, brainstorm. Now, in that process of brainstorming, you will be planning. So you would have identified your topic. You would have known where you want to go, what is the purpose for conducting whatever research that you need to do. You would have broken down your topic into components, manageable components, manageable areas that you can take on step by step. Now, after you have done all of that planning, it means that the maze is no longer a maze. You're no longer running like a hamster on a wheel. Your path has been set. So what you can aim to do now is to gather the information. And that is where you will determine at this point whether you need to gather the information using existing databases, catalogs, going to the library, or using the internet, sourcing all of the data, whether it be primary or secondary, using the internet as your resource tool. Now, once you've done all of that, your job is now to sift and sort. Sift and sort. So you will go through and determine, what do I need to keep? What speaks directly to what I am doing? Do I need to return to the planning stage or is the information sufficient to do what I need to do, to present what I need to present? Is the information sufficient to provide me with the answers to the questions that I have? 
So, Ms. Hines, you said before we start to gather information, before you start to acquire that information, going out and ascertaining everything, you plan first. You must plan. So there is that there focus. There is nothing you can do without first planning. So there's that, and planning will give you that focus, direct you as to where to exactly. gather and what to gather. Exactly. What do you need for your IA? Exactly. All right. So, so it you gives you the like direction. Right, I no, you won't. That at the end you won't Not look at all. Like him, all right? That's Not at all. And we're hoping that by the end of this lesson, Bright Barry doesn't look like Bright Barry. All right, because you would have planned and you would have gathered and you would have sorted and sifted. And those are the three basic steps in, um, in how you approach your research paper. And afterwards, of course, you know, you would synthesize because you start putting mm -hmm. together, you, the steps become a little bit more advanced and maybe a little bit more complicated. That's right. But do not worry yourself right there where you sit, you are brainstorming right there in your city, wherever you are on the dining table, start brainstorming. What is it that I want to write about? And start making your jottings. When you have that in your head, mm -hmm. then it is that you start even begin to think about with the information that you need. Makes sense, doesn't it? All right? Very much so. Now, we also know, need to remind them yes. that it is a cyclical process. In By that you mean? Repetitive actions. So you will continue to repeat the actions until you have garnered all that you need to garner. So you will different times in the process have to return to the drawing table all right to determine what you need now having done all of that having gone through the brainstorming process having gathered having sifted and sorted you now need to do another critical component of the process and this is called evaluating your sources now you have it you are now going to assess it because remember you know, you're not going to have all of this information and just put it just begin it just begin to type 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 because mm -hmm. i have information that um as it relates to my ia no mm -hmm. you are going to have to evaluate your sources so we're looking at some of the steps in evaluating your currency i don't mean us now you know or that is what you'd want to think how up to date is your how current is there is the information that you have remember we spoke about the secondary sources that the information may be outdated mm -hmm. so you need to look at currency you also need to look at um, validity very very important what is validity validity speaks to asking yourself does this argument it does it do what it says what the author claims that it does is it true uh, so, does the source present logical arguments Ah, so what you're saying to me is that validity tests accuracy. It does. Ah. So we're looking at accuracy and we move right across now to reliability. Remember, we're evaluating the sources. Mm. And this speaks to how consistent is the data presented. Consistency. Mm. You look quizzical, Miss Hines. What so is it this? means that I repeat... I'm hoping that over time, over time, that I will repeat. She says the key to over time, the, the information, information will be repeated. So it remains ah. the same. It is consistent. Mm. And then, of course, with all of this, validity and reliability would underpin the last one. Credibility. Is the author an expert mm. in the field? So I'm thinking about character. You are thinking about character. So we're thinking consistency, hmm. accuracy, character, currency. Don't forget the four C's. That's what they are. That's how you evaluate your sources. Do you recognize now that there is absolutely nothing to worry about? In the lesson, we said it was research and sourcing of information. And you are, I, I'm sure that after today, you will start calm and easy. You know how to go about sourcing. Slow and easy does it. Okay. So don't you worry. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about a thing. Don't panic. I'm sure we would have thrown some light on the topic, I'm sure. See the light bulb going off in your head? You should and see then, it there. Okay. So now that you understand all of this, remember, don't panic. Don't panic. Bob Marley says, don't worry about a thing. Once you follow the steps, every little thing it's is going to be, be all right. right. Evaluate your sources to ensure that it's relevant for your eye.
don't frustrate your teachers now. Make sure the in your content makes sense. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to do that, you must evaluate. But it's not only just frustrating the teachers. Don't frustrate yourselves. That's right. So there will be no frustration. There will be no bright barry. Right? With regards to your IAs. No. We would have settled down. We would have been planned. sourcing. Would have planned. Mm -hmm. Sifted, sorted, gathered. Uh, you sift and sort what you have gathered. You would have determined what information you need. And there you go now into starting your IA. Your internal assessment for your IA. Thank you so much for joining us. The Dynamic Duo is back, right? <laughs> we are back with you and um, back don't with panic the because we have started you on the right track on how to approach writing your internal assessment. Now, if you have not already done so, please select your topic. It's time. This is October. It is time. And if you have done so, your homework is to go start planning, gathering, sorting, and sifting. Have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you so much for joining us.